Good morning. Welcome to session number two. Session number two of the resource sharing conference. Are you being fulfilled? This session is being recorded. Participation denotes your consent to being recorded. You are welcome to say hello in chat and share reactions and resources to keep the conversation going. Please use the Q&A feature to ask the presenter questions and we can track them easily. As you interact with each other today, please remember that this is a safe place for everyone. Please use the chat and the Q&A features accordingly. Feel free to share about the conference at our hashtag SharingVisions2020. Presenter resources and session recordings will be made available on the conference website. And a conference evaluation will be sent emailed to attendees the day after the conference. My name is Dawn Laval. I'm the Director Division of Library Development for the Connecticut State Library. And on behalf of CSL, we're very pleased to be a part of this conference. The Connecticut State Library has been providing resource sharing programs for over 40 years to Connecticut libraries. Along the way, we have encountered challenges and opportunities, but through strategic decisions and partnerships, in particular with Bibliomation, Connecticut's largest consortium, we have overcome significant budget cuts to position the state library to continue statewide resourcing, resource sharing services. CSL DLD Advisory Council for Library Planning and Development Resource Sharing Committee has developed a Connecticut vision for resource sharing using strategic foresight to develop possible scenarios for resource sharing. Strong resource sharing practices, expansion of digital resources, content and access through collaboration, non-traditional, will create robust, resilient, adaptive resource sharing going forward. I'm very pleased to introduce the Connecticut team. Brad Bullis is the Digital Content and Innovation Coordinator at the Connecticut State Library, Division of Library Development. He oversees the Request It CT, Ego CT, and Research It CT programs and works with public libraries to deliver services to veterans and their families. He previously worked at the New Haven Free Public Library for 20 years and at the Yale University for six years before that. Gail Hurley is a Professional Development Coordinator at the Connecticut State Library. She oversees Find It CT Statewide Library Catalog and works on special grant projects with NEH and the Library of Congress for newspaper digitization, NASA at my library and others. Gail's been with the Connecticut State Library for 20 years and the Capital Region Library Council for 10 years before that. Amy Trilaga is Director of Member Services at Bibliomation, a Connecticut con consortium currently consisting of 65 libraries, eight schools, and three special libraries. Amy is responsible for the management of Bibliomation's library services and is very active in Evergreen open source community. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our team, Brad, Gail, and Amy. Okay, thank you, Don. Uh, good morning. My name is Gail Hurley, and as Don said, I'm with the Connecticut State Library's Division of Library Development. Uh, my background as it relates to this project uh, is in the area of catalogs and ILS systems. I worked as a system specialist, ILS specialist for 10 years at the Capital Region Library Council, which was one of our regional networks in Connecticut, um, now called uh, Library Connection. Um, I served, uh, or actually I uh, joined the State Library in 2000, and I served as the statewide library catalog coordinator for my first 15 years and now have resumed that responsibility again this year. Um, our statewide catalog was called Request with the capital Q, as you see on the screen. And we had uh, used Autographics Union Catalog software. Um, we now have our new open source catalog, which you'll hear about, uh, called Find It CT, uh, using fulfillment based on Evergreen. So some background information, uh, like Dawn mentioned, Connecticut has had a very long history of library resource sharing going back to the 1970s, um, where like anyone with the Connecticut public library card could use it to borrow and return books from any other public library in Connecticut um, who was participating in the program. And we also had a delivery service as well. Um, in 1988, 
the Connecticut Library Information Network awarded money to the Capital Region Library Council for the production of a CD-ROM product um, to use as an alternate to an online catalog um, for their system called CIRCSES. At the very same time, the Connecticut State Library was also looking into a CD-ROM catalog. So the two projects merged and became the basis of our statewide union catalog called Request, uh, which was later administered uh, by the Connecticut State Library. In the early days of Request, approximately 60 libraries contributed records to that statewide catalog. But what began in March of 89 as a set of two DOS-based CD-ROM disks um, that were only available from a dedicated workstation had progressed to become an exciting online catalog available from any computer with internet access. And more than 400 libraries of all types had contributed approximately 6 million records and over 23 million holdings to requests through its history ending in 2015, uh, which I'll talk more about in a bit. So Request originally was created as an index to the collections of libraries throughout the state, um, eventually also including the Connecticut Union list of serials, um, but no circulation status information was available within the catalog. But there were many requests for the catalog to show circulation and shelf status, but the you know, technology just wasn't there at the time. Um, but then with Z3950 technology, uh, Request was able to make connections to live library catalogs that also employed the Z3950 um, technology to display both the copies of items and their respective um, shelf statuses. But since the mid 90s, when the catalog evolved from that CD-ROM to an online, Request also started offering additional services to libraries in Connecticut. Um, such as interlibrary loan and also a cataloging service using those MARC records that were found in the statewide library catalog. ILL was part of the CD product, but staff members of participating libraries had to print the ILL requests and then send them either by mail or uh, fax them. Since its inception as an online system, the ILL module had allowed patrons to initiate and track their ILL requests and library staff members to process requests entirely online. While the state library continued to implement as many enhancements as we could our, um, you know, with our traditional ILS vendor, we were always scanning the horizon to see what else was out there and paid um, pretty close attention to like Marshall Breeding's library systems report that came out each year on the various ILS systems. And then also when they started uh, talking about the new open source solutions that were out there. So about 2010, uh, we really started following the developments of uh, open source, especially fulfillment, uh, which was an open source software being developed by Equinox that would promote uh, resource sharing among disparate systems. And I can tell you uh, that at one time I was managing loads to our catalog from 18 different systems in our small state. Um, we had spoken with staff at um, OhioNet who were working with Equinox on developing the fulfillment software and also spoke with uh, some library systems who had, um, you know, in Canada too, uh, had province-wide or statewide ILS um, systems based on using traditional ILS vendors. But we were always looking into possible alternatives um, and futures for our statewide catalog and ILL systems as costs rose and um, budget cuts were always uh, looming. Um, and we were always looking for more enhancements tailored to our library's needs and our patrons' needs, which we would have had to wait for uh, with the rest of the libraries using our same vendor. So uh, Brad, next slide, please. Thank you. But in 2015, we, we got hit with budget cuts, uh, which made it hard to be able to afford to continue with our current system. 
our contract um, with our vendor was, was actually ending. So um, after 25 years online, plans were made to tra um, transition off of the ILL system and request officially went offline uh, June 30th, 2015. Uh, my colleague Amy will be talking uh, more about this next, but the Connecticut State Library partnered with Bibliomation to build a statewide catalog um, based on the Evergreen platform. And the first version of our new open source catalog rebranded as Find It CT went online in 2016 with over 10 million items loaded from more than 150 public school and academic libraries from their consortial catalogs or individual library catalogs. And this was done after some basic initial development, um, many fixes and enhancements were made to make this a discoverable catalog. And a later phase was to develop the ILL system and train libraries on its use. Um, we are currently now up to 377 libraries in our Find It uh, catalog uh, with more than 20 million items. So now I'm going to turn this over to Amy next. Thanks, Gail. Hello, I'm Amy Terlaga, Director of Member Services at Bibliomation, a Connecticut Library Consortium. My job has me coordinate between five departments, the Evergreen Department, Help Desk, Database Services, which is cataloging for our libraries, Bibliotech, uh, which is remote technical support for our libraries and network services, which is telecom services. Bibliomation has been around since 1980 and we're on our fourth ILS and some say our last um, because our current ILS has been such a good fit for us. For the record, we started with GIAC, migrated to CARL in 1994 before it became TLC CARL. Then I started working at Bibliomation in 1995. In 2004, I handled our ILS migration to Dynex before it became Circe Dynex. And then in 2010, we started a pilot project and brought some new libraries up on Evergreen. Once we saw that this worked beautifully, we migrated all of our libraries to Evergreen in the spring of 2011. Bibliomation partnered with the Connecticut State Library in early 2015 when Carl D'Amelia, our executive director, was approached by Ken Wigan, then state librarian, to see if we could come up with an open source alternative to the current statewide ILL solution. Why us? Well, we had some experience with open source. Our current ILS is Evergreen, and we had been running Evergreen since 2010, and it had been going very well despite some staff changes over the years in our Evergreen department. Here is where I'd like to say, if you're thinking about an open source solution, whether it be fulfillment or Evergreen or Koha or something else, hire and promote well. You need people who are comfortable with change, who aren't afraid to try new things and like working with com a community of smart individuals who love innovation and like to be challenged by their work. For instance, the two people we initially had in charge of implementing the fulfillment software, although very talented and dedicated, both left roughly around the same time, um, which although it was a blow to us, um, we managed to recover because uh, the good news was that the person we moved into the manager's position had a tremendous amount of experience and had already shown leadership qualities. She was able to mentor our new hire in the areas he needed, and he was very knowledgeable when it came to servers and operating systems like Linux. So it was a really great fit. So why did we consider fulfillment as a solution for the Connecticut State Library's ILL system? We had been following its development over the years. There were some pilot projects, including OhioNet and Ohio, these pilot projects had fizzled out for one reason or another, usually funding was the reason. But the demonstration of the software made it look pretty easy and intuitive to use. Another reason for our interest, it was built by Equinox Open Library Initiative on the same architecture as their ILS Evergreen. And we were very familiar and happy with Evergreen. 
One more reason, since this was open source software, even if it wasn't designed specifically for us, we could pay for customizations that were exactly how we needed it to work. Our experience with open source software up until then was that the turnaround time was relatively quick compared to proprietary software, where as a consortium, our experience had been to have our requests low on the list of priorities and a lot of times not considered at all. The first year was taken up with the discoverable catalog enhancements as fulfillment wasn't originally designed to be a discoverable catalog. In spring of 2017, 22 Connecticut libraries were trained on request it. That's the ILL um, portion. Um, it was the state library's rebranding of the ILL piece of fulfillment. That fall, many more libraries were trained. Currently, there are 131 libraries using request it. I sat in on the trainings while Steve Kaufman, the Connecticut State Library ILL coordinator at the time, trained all of these librarians. Steve's an excellent trainer, but the one thing I picked up from these trainings was how much the design of the software guided the workflow. It seemed easy to remember what you had to do next. The fact that Steve wasn't having to repeat himself that much gave me confidence that the trainees were getting it very quickly. Understand that the Connecticut librarians uh, were being trained on what we came to call basic fulfillment ILL. We had not yet implemented the connectors and that software that would allow a seamless transfer of information between fulfillment and the native ILS. With the connector in place, if you check something out in fulfillment, it would automatically be checked out in your local ILS. With basic fulfillment ILL, there was a need to for double checkouts and double check-ins, once in fulfillment and once in your local ILS. There was also a need for ILL staff to keep a separate record of their patrons who had requested the material. Uh, so a little bit about enhancements. Um, we've added a number of enhancements to the fulfillment software over the years. Some were deemed high priority by the participating libraries like adding a request pull list and adding the delivery route name to the printed slips. Some um, were considered more medium than high, like the ability to change the request to a different barcode for the same title. Brad will mention a little more about our most recent enhancements later in the presentation. In total, we've added 19 enhancements, improving the functionality of requested. Lastly, I wanna mention a little bit about the cost of a fulfillment um, for the, the State Library. Uh, the Connecticut State Library made the decision to pursue an open source ILL and searchable catalog solution in part as a cost savings goal. We are in year six of our fulfillment partnership with the State Library and it has pro proven to be that. The components of the project with dollars attached include these broad categories, system hardware, system infrastructure support, such as server support and networking support, fulfillment database maintenance, fulfillment software development, uh, that's th those enhancements I talked about, and customer support. The software development piece, which includes ongoing enhancements and connector development comprises roughly one third of our annual budget. It is important to note that the Connecticut State Library had to absorb all of the costs for the 19 enhancements plus the Evergreen connector that were added since 2017. We continue to be the only fulfillment project currently active. We'd love for that to change. It becomes more affordable when you're sharing the cost with two or three other sites in the fulfillment open source community than when you're the only one. And now I will hand it over to Brad. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Brad Bullis. I'm the Digital Content and Innovation Coordinator from the Connecticut State Library, and I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, so first, I want to start talking a little bit about ILL in the days of old, which really goes back to the early days of my career. My experience with interlibrary loan began at the Yale Law Library back in 1994. 
I also went on to oversee the borrowing side of interlibrary loan at the Yale Medical Library from 1996 to 1999. Our office handled more than a thousand requests per month, but ILL back then was basically paper-based in terms of the way you tracked it. We did use Arlen and OCLC for ordering, but all the tracking was done on paper. One of the main things I learned is that there's a lot of attention to detail that's integrated into an interlibrary loan process. In 1999, I joined the New Haven Free Public Library and I worked there for over 20 years. But my, for my first three years there, I ran the interlibrary loan department. We used requests from Autographics at that time. This was a very good product, um, but we did still need to maintain a paper log to track requests as they move through the system. Now to move on to more of the recent past and the present, um, as I believe Amy had mentioned, fulfillment went live in April of 2017. Now I joined the Connecticut State Library in December of 2019. So unfortunately I missed the initial development and implementation of fulfillment. Steve Kaufman, who many of you may know, he's a bit of a legend in the world of interlibrary loan, uh, retired in August and I took over the requested program at that time. So I'm a little bit new to request it and also to fulfillment. As Amy mentioned, we now have 131 libraries participating in fulfillment. Although some libraries haven't gone live again in fulfillment since shutting down when the pandemic hit back in March. But we do have 73 libraries that are currently actively participating and we can see uh, usage in fulfillment growing again. Trying to get my next slide, okay. Um, as you can see from this slide, um, we have seen some growth in usage and fulfillment since July when we actively really started utilizing the platform again. Um, if you look at July, you can see we're between 200 and 300 requests per month. In August, we're between 300 and 400. By September, we're between 400 and 500 requests and then in October, we're right around 600 requests per month. And our average prior to the pandemic was about 750. So as you can see, uh, we're trending uh, in the right direction. And I think if you consider the fact that only 73 libraries are participating right now actively, as we get more libraries to jump on board uh, and really in the current environment, I think we're going to see uh, an increase in usage over time. So one of the things about uh, this evolution into, um, you know, during the pandemic where libraries are beginning to use it again and my transition into this new position is libraries have reached out to me uh, for a refresher training. Um, so I have been able to do that for a few libraries. And, um, and you know, as someone who had never interacted with the system before, uh, I was very new to fulfillment, um, but I was very impressed by the way it was organized. Um, so as you can see from this slide here, um, there are tabs across the top that basically are the steps in an interlibrary loan request process. Uh, so you have pending requests, you have inbound transits, you have outbound transits, you have an on-shelf tab, and then currently circulating. Um, now the key feature with these tabs is that each tab is broken down into a borrowing side and a lending side. And this is really critical um, anybody who has worked in interlibrary loan for any length of time, I think realizes that uh, as simple as it may seem, it's easy to get the borrowing side and the lending side confused at times. Um, so the, the interface and the way it's uh, presented um, really helps to mitigate any potential confusion. Uh, so this has been truly a real positive um, for me uh, as I begin to integrate my uh, experience with fulfillment uh, but as I share it with other libraries as well, uh, it's very easy to explain. So the other aspect of fulfillment that I really appreciate is the integration of the Find It catalog uh, right in here. And as you can see, right on the, uh, the opening page of fulfillment, there's a link to the Find It catalog. Uh, so this is really helpful um, because in fact, once you log into fulfillment, you are automatically logged in to find it and you can initiate requests directly from your search. So 
So let's talk a little bit about enhancements. Uh, I know Amy had mentioned quite a bit about that, but I will just add some information about recent enhancements and future enhancements. So in term of, terms of recent enhancements, um, last summer we actually initiated a retargeting feature. And this is a feature that allows staff to disallow interlibrary loan requests either temporarily for a single request or permanently for all current and future requests of that item. Included with this is an action trigger, and this alerts requesting libraries when an interlibrary loan request has become, become unfillable due to uh, a lack of available copies at lending libraries. Now, to me, this is a really important piece of the fulfillment uh, software because what it does is it allows communication to occur uh, with the users and it really helps to establish where a, an interlibrary loan request might be in a process and the fact that a, a book may no longer be available or isn't available in this request process. So the communication that the system provides I think is very helpful as you're trying to navigate your interlibrary loan workflow. Another new feature that we initiated in October is the multiple copy request feature. So prior to this, libraries had been using our interlibrary loan listserv to request multiple copies or entering them one at a time into fulfillment. And as you can imagine, that's not the most efficient way to process an interlibrary loan request, especially when there are multiple interlibrary loan requests. Now the system allows you to easily select a number of copies from a drop-down menu up to 25 copies at a time. This is a great way to request multiple items for book groups, and it has been very well received by our participating libraries. We have received so much positive feedback about this feature. So uh, obviously it's had an uh, improvement on the workflow for these particular libraries. So in terms of future enhancements, we are also testing the patron initiated staff mediated feature with one of our public libraries and hope to have that rolled out sometime in 2021. Um, this basically allows patrons to initiate a request and then the staff can review that request in the staff mediation portion and then the request can move on through the system. So this requires the use of connectors which allow fulfillment and the library's ILS to communicate, thus removing duplicate steps in the interlibrary loan process. Now this will be a big change and an important update to fulfillment and will have a significant effect on interlibrary loan workflow for libraries. Equinox, the company that supports fulfillment, developed a connector for the Evergreen ILS. We will first roll out the connector to libraries that are in bibliomation. These libraries are evergreen libraries and fulfillment is based on the evergreen architecture. So they are inherently compatible. But again, before we go live with this feature, we wanna be sure that it improves the workflow for users. That is why we wanna test it with libraries before any official rollout. And as I said, we will start with the evergreen libraries before moving on to other libraries because there are multiple ILSs being utilized in the state of Connecticut. It's going to take time to build connectors for each ILS currently being utilized, but starting with the evergreen connector makes the most sense and will provide us with a good understanding of any potential challenges and allow for a smooth process for the next batch of libraries that connectors are created for. With that in mind, I'm definitely looking forward to moving on to this process in 2021. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it back to Dawn, and I believe we're going to open it up for questions. Yeah, I just have a, um, I, I want everyone to know this has been an extraordinary journey with Bibliomation. It was an incredible partnership to work in a very trying time when our budget was cut in half. And we had to find a solution, um, not in a year, we had, the, um, we had to find a solution within months. So um, for Bibliomation to come on board with us and find and um, offer this extraordinary um, opportunity was incredibly important for us. It has not been without challenge. Our time frame has changed multiple times, but we're at a point in this project right now where it's just basically building and enhancing and making it the best um, tool available for Connecticut librarians. So I, I want to know one thing um, for, and maybe this might be for um, Amy, um, what is the workload like 
like for your central staff? What is it like when, what was it like to get started with fulfillment and setting up the software? Setting it up was not, uh, was not extremely difficult. And the reason that that was is because we were familiar with the evergreen software. And so the, the same settings that had to be um, utilized to create the, the, the infrastructure, the, um, the architecture of the fulfillment software was kind of already obvious to us. So I don't remember there being an awful lot of um, confusing, you know, and, and taking a long time. So, um, it, you know, it was a bit more of a challenge because there were so many libraries and so many disparate institutions. <coughs> Excuse me. But the, I think the, the biggest hassle headache was the loading of the records that um, we had, um, Equinox had started the process and then turned it over to us. And I think part of the reason why they turned it over to us is because it was so, so time consuming and, you know, so um, frustrating. And because again, there were so many different ILSs in Connecticut. So you, it wasn't like a one size fits all, um, set it up and, and you're done. You had, they, it had to be kept being tweaked um, depending on the, the library and the, the ILS. What we ended up getting, this is one of the enhancements and it was probably the, one of the best enhancements we got was an automatic load, uh, automatic data load. So it didn't have to be babysat so much anymore. And it, it, uh, it could be set up and then kind of forgotten about. So uh, that's, that's what I'll, I think that's probably um, the most I can say about that. Ongoing, it hasn't been bad at all. Um, and, you know, and, and maintaining the, um, the setup of, say, say a library um, doesn't want to do fulfillment for whatever reason for a little bit, and we need to turn them off. It's very easy. It's a, it's a, it takes, you know, 15 seconds to, to turn a library off. It's not a complicated procedure. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it, it hasn't really been a huge drain now on our, our staff um, keeping fulfillment going. Again, I'd, I'd say the data loads are still the most time consuming aspect of it, but it's, it's nowhere near the, what it used to be. Great. So there's a question, um, is there a plan to eventually link um, our statewide catalog with Massachusetts Comcat and other New England statewide catalogs? And that's certainly something at the State Library that we would, we would envision if we're truly envisioning um, resource sharing and, and then the regional aspect. Um, so Amy, is there, is there the capability to link our this catalog with other catalogs? Would it be similar to a connector? You know what, maybe. I, I actually don't know that answer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I would have to refer that to Equinox if, if they were only here. <laughs> well, but, it's certainly uh, something we can explore, right? <laughs> absolutely, we would, yeah, it would that, it's, yeah um, I'm gonna write that one down and, and, and follow up on that and see what I can learn. Cause yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. And uh, I, I, I would think that the software would be well designed to do something like that, yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Tim, that that put a spark into our conversation and probably more projects coming up. Um, so there's another question. What ILS connectors do you envision working on first after the Evergreen connector is running smoothly? So have, have we already began that? Uh, Brad, th th this is a connector question. Did you want to take that or did you want me to? Well, if you could start and then I'll jump in. Just, I think you might know the status a little bit better than me. Okay. Um, well, what I, I can tell you is that the next connector is going to be triple I um, Sierra connector because it would um, uh, 
uh, bring Lion, um, Lion Libraries, um, you know, which is a, a consortium in Connecticut that's uh, got a number of libraries um, associated with it. So it would it would be a good you know good bang for the buck um, bringing them in next, and then and then it's just a matter of prioritizing all the different ILSs and. Um, you know, we, we have a list. Um, uh, I don't know, Brad, if you wanted to continue with that. Well, you know, I don't have the list in front of me, but we do have oh. multiple ILSs, as I mentioned, in the state. And, you know, the, um, the key thing is really just to make sure that we're, once we start, I think once we get the Evergreen um, connector up and running and we're able to do, say, patron-initiated uh, staff mediated, you know, we'll start to see what the problems are and the challenges are, uh, and then we can really begin to roll it out. But we do have, um, we do have an order, and it's based on really this, to some extent, the size of the consortium, um, and you know, the number of uh, folks that are using a particular ILS. That's right. That's right. And and he's right in that it will. Each one will take some time because you have to. It, it, it the first one is evergreen, and that. That's almost a no-brainer because it's it's uh, very similar to fulfillment and um, and you know Equinox has access to it. It's open source. Same thing with like a Koha connector. It's it's open source software, so it's you know should be easier um, for uh, the programming of that. So I have another question. Um, can fulfillment be configured to work with other interlibrary loan management systems like? Tipasa, Iliad, Clio, et cetera, that a library may already have in place to fill out to fill out of state or regional requests? Again, I think it would have the potential to do that. Um, I would want to have conversations with Equinox to, to find out what uh, what would it entail to, to have that um, interface with other ILL systems. Um, it really, I believe it's got great potential to do that. Uh, you know, the, I, I think also that Equinox is uh, looking at um, launching uh, a, sort of a marketing campaign to get the word out to, to see if uh, other libraries, other consortia are interested in joining up. I think that we, where we've brought the software makes it much more attractive to potential other potential um, sites because the the enhancements have have made it much more much more of a plug and play sort of environment than what it initially was. So, and to build on that, Amy, I, I'm I'm curious um, because I talk about this a lot, but I'm I'm not the technical person. That's why I had Gail and Brad here, um, but. Uh, so a lot of what's been the work that's been done on our catalog and our fulfillment system are is that all um, new? Is it? It's are the enhancements that are being developed something that is is were not there before but have been developed for based upon our requests and our needs? That's correct. That, that's that's absolutely right. And so that's why I think it would be much more. Um, acceptable to other, not that it wasn't uh, functional to begin with, it's just it, it, improvements, right? You know, yeah. th things like that request pull list, it makes it easier now to use, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis for libraries. So, so I think it's it's kind of like, because we have so many different ILS, I don't know, you know, I mean, we have well over 20 different ILS systems in the state, I would assume. Um, but yeah, bringing all those together in one statewide, um, one statewide product uh, is something that is, is unique. Yes, uh, yes, but uh, but I'm also going to write down that you know what about using it with other ILL systems because yeah. that's, that's that's another really good question. These are good questions. Yeah, <laughs> more work for you. So um, so the other. Um, uh, uh, and I think Rachel's, I think Rachel, I think you're talking about doing the resource sharing to interlibrary loan is the delivery systems between Massachusetts, New York and Rhode Island, for instance. Um, so that's certainly something on our radar as well at this, at this Connecticut State Library is, is those interstate delivery. Um, I, I'm 
I'm hoping that's what you're um, referring to. But it's certainly something that anytime you're doing resource sharing on a regional level, you have to have all the aspects of support, whether it be the, the software, or whether it be the actual physical delivery and, and so forth. Um, Chai-Chen has an answer. Um, as you bring different ILS systems into fulfillment, have you experienced any challenges because of the ILS's lack of compliance with the industry standards? I think that's we an had, Amy question. Yeah, we had some issues. We did. That's that's yeah, yes. Yeah. So whoever asked that, it's it's like they had the inside track or, or just assumed <laughs> that there would there would be some issues there. Uh, yeah, it went, that's what took it. Actually, it took, you know, that first year trying to bring this up, uh, just get, getting the catalog up. That the, because of that lack of standardization, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of back and forth to try and get it so that we could load those records in and that they would display properly. So yes, that was an issue, uh, but um, Equinox um, worked through those issues with us um, and, uh, and managed to resolve them all. And, and, you know, and back and forth sometimes with the ILS vendor, if the library didn't know, you know, the library was just, just, just doing what they were used to doing for, for years and, and didn't even know that there would be a, an issue. Um, but um, but yeah, no, we did, we, we did have some, some of those issues. And again, it's, it's the Connecticut, well, somebody used this expression years ago and I've, I've, um, I use it frequently, but you know, Connecticut is the, the, the state of let every flower bloom. And <laughs> we've had so many different ILSs and sometimes different uh, versions of the same ILS, but because it was a different version, it's 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 complicated matters. For our colleagues out there, we um, Connecticut does not have um, standardized um, procedures, processes, guidelines, and so forth. As as Amy alluded to, it's it's different all around, which makes it a challenge when you're trying to bring together. Um, a bunch of different ILS systems into in one working system to to support resource sharing. So so Brad, um, how have you found the response to be from during your training, the time, the short time that you've done training and working with Steve? How have you find found the response to be from li the libraries? Have they found this particular um, uh, element to be user friendly? You know, I think that's uh, something I picked up on right away. First of all, I had to learn fulfillment myself. Uh, it was something that was new to me, and I was able to learn it fairly quick, quickly with Steve's help, of course, but then on my own. And then I had to basically digest that information and share it with libraries. And so I was able to do that. And then during the training sessions, I found that it went very smoothly. As Amy said, you know, there weren't a lot of questions. People seemed to understand it right away. And, and I think the way that the interface is, is set up really leads to that you know, user-friendly uh, experience. Um, so the experience for the user seems to be um, very positive. And you know, the follow-up questions I typically get after a training are not really based on the interface of fulfillment. It might be more about how they can modify their workflow or some, some tips about interlibrary loan workflow that they're looking for, or even just updating their contact information or something very simple like that. Um, but the, the response during the training is so, you know, is one of understanding. So I think based on that, uh, that, that is an indication that the user interface is, is really very user friendly. Great. So, so when um, the Connecticut State Library entered into this, basically it was a leap of faith going from a um, ILS system that we've had for 25 plus years to going into the complete unknown um, with, with a basically building a, a structure from the ground up. Um, I just want to know what your thoughts on, on the benefits. Of course, you know, we're a little skewed now, but what are the benefits of working with an open source system like Evergreen? Yeah, I mean, I think the positive uh, experience you have, and this will really benefit other libraries, is that, you know, if you do run into an issue, you start to get feedback from the folks that are using it in the public libraries and the academics and the schools as well, um, is that you can bring that information to Bibliomation and Equinox 
and they start to develop solutions for that. Um, and I think it's just the flexibility and agility that you get working with an open source uh, platform like this, you know, is so positive. And, and, you know, I do see over time as other libraries and other states um, start to take advantage of the system, you know, they will reap the benefit of the hard work that we're doing now. Um, so that's, you know, I think Amy has mentioned that to me before, and it seems to be um, pretty important when you start to look at what platform you want to utilize uh, in your state for interlibrary loan. Great. So unless there's any other questions or comments, I, th I think we're going to win the prize today for finishing first. Um, but I, I want to share with everyone that's um, with us today that we would be more than happy at the Connecticut State Library. Um, Brad, um, you know, of our partners, Amy and Carl at Bibliomation, if you should ever consider or you're in the position, I hope no one's in the position that we were put in um, to have to make an extraordinary decision in a short amount of time, um, but to have the, um, just the um, wonderful partner that we do have in, in Biblium Bibliomation that work with us to come up with the solution. We would be more than happy to um, share with you the process that we went through, um, what the work was. And as, as you know, has been mentioned, a lot of the enhancements um, have already been done. So um, at some point in time, this may be a, a as, as Amy said, a plug and play product that, that can be an alternative if you're, you find yourself in the same situation that we unfortunately found ourselves um, in, a, in a few, um, you know, it's been, I can't believe it's been six years, but but we're here and we have a catalog and it works and people are doing interlibrary loans. So we're very, we're very appreciative of that. So feel free to reach out to us, um, specifically Brad or Gail Hurley, um, if you have any questions about um, the transition from, um, and I will share, we were with previously with autographics, um, our transition, transition from autographics to um, Evergreen Fulfillment, Equinox, all the different names are associated. We'd be more than happy to help you out with that. Um, and in the interim, um, thank you so much for participating in this um, program. As we said earlier, I, um, the evaluation will be going up and it's my turn to actually, we are going into lunch time. So we're going to have our virtual lunches. Um, if everybody can come back at 1230, um, the 1230 session pro project reshare community owned resource sharing system will be up and ready to go. But then again, thank you so much for participating. We appreciate it and ha have a great lunch. And also don't forget to share hashtag sharing visions 2020. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. <laughs>